I'm so happy to see all of you today. You guys had a great time at the reception yesterday? <laughs> yeah, no, maybe? <laughs> Don't remember? <laughs> well, I'm so happy you decided to join. Today, we will be talking about how to lead projects and open source teams with better feedback. And I'm assuming everyone knows about feedback. Everyone has gotten feedback on either their code or their, um, their paper or something else. So we are going to be looking at how we can improve the feedback loop to kind of get both positive and negative feedback. And we'll dive into that. And then we'll look at how to actually deliver it. But first, a little bit about me. For people that don't know, my name is Jessica. I'm in my 20s, and I'm currently studying computer science. Other than that, I started doing tech and coding from a very, very early age. So I have kind of been on the sideline looking in, in the open source space for a long time. I've done open source projects before I could even, I can even remember. I'm also a maintainer of PyPanda, which is a very popular Python library to, uh, that's a wrapper around the, Python, the Pandoc document converter. Recently, in 2023, I joined the GitHub Accelerator program, which is, was a program hosted by GitHub where they took a bunch of projects and put us through a 10 week program to try to find new ways to do sustainable open source, more focused on the financial side. And this summer I had an internship, a software engineering internship at Uber, where I learned everything about distributed systems and how to work in a team. And that is where probably a lot of my stories will come from as well as Having to, as well as me having to give feedback to a lot of people from a very early age because the people look at my eyes, you'll probably notice something a little bit peculiar. I'm fully blind, which means that I have to basically be a first for many people. So, whenever I've been in contact with institutions, teachers, colleagues we've always had to work together to try to figure out how to do things and it's all usually been me that's been in the pro in the in the position where i've had to give them feedback on how they're doing so based on that i feel i i have a good basis to talk about this but we'll see <laughs> so what we'll be covering today We'll take a look at what feedback is, as well as we'll try to dive deep into the actual definitions and the different type of feedback that we can give each other, both as maintainers to contributors and contributors in between. Then we'll take a look at what a wider implication of good feedback actually means for the ecosystem as a whole. And then we'll look at how to deliver it, how to how to phrase it, what to do, what not to do. And we can look at, we'll look at how to combine them and deliver, and then at the end there'll be some time for Q&A, hopefully. So. Feedback in open source. Feedback is the way we communicate with each other to describe if something is good, bad, negative, or positive, and there is a very sharp distinction between those. The entire ecosystem is based on feedback because that's the way we actually we collaborate. We always come with suggestions. Just, just the act of coming with a suggestion to other people's work is a kind of feedback. Without feedback, we do not have any opportunity to help each other grow or to help the ecosystem as a whole thrive and continue forward. The talk here will be mainly focused on from a maintainer to a contributor perspective of feedback as well as contributor to contributor. This works both in open, smaller open source projects and also in larger organizations with inter-team relations.
So the difficulties about about giving feedback is we don't, don't everyone have the exact same background. I will almost guarantee that everyone in this room right now has their own experiences that, that they have lived through, their own challenges, the things that they're good at and the things that they're bad at. Because of that, it can be easy if, if, if feedback is not delivered in the correct way to um, come into very easy and harmful miscommunication that can lead to demotivation and dis discouragement for continuing working on open source. I've had the same in my own experiences where a bad example of feedback is, can both be with the, on the negative side where, where you have a code review as an example where the only thing people point out is all the things you need to change. Has anyone ever had that happen to them where they, where you had some code you contributed and the only thing people commented on what were things you had to do better? Yeah. 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 <laughs> that can be very discouraging. But the opposite is also true. Where the only thing people say is going be also more contributed in the soft skills, maybe, where um, people only talk about your good sides. People, is there anyone that's had that happen where people only give you positive feedback? Yeah. That can also be very challenging when we'll get into, into that very soon. So, that positive feedback is all the good things. The, the things we get told we're good at. It feels very good to be told you're good at something. It boosts your confidence, of course. It makes you want to continue con contributing to whatever you are doing, that be a project or a team. And of course, it promotes a positive environment. If everyone's positive, then that means that your team as a whole is going to be very happy. It can feel really good after a long time of negativity to get something positive. Imagine after a code review, you get to told something positive. That, that can feel very good. But as I said, it can also be very bad in the sense that you don't actually have anything to work on. If the only thing you get told that you're good at things, well, I'm already good at those things. So what am I gonna work on? So the example is just this, especially if they don't actually describe what's, um, especially if they describe, they don't actually describe what is good. Like as an ex with the example we have, it's just, this is looking good. But that's the bad example, whereas the good example can be, it looks good and then they actually describe what you did well. So you know what you need to continue working on. So the impact, the impact of negative feedback. Negative feedback is the sense that that's the things you need to work on. Um, so again, negative feedback can be very easy to miscommunicate or it can also, if you get too much of it at the same time, it can also make you feel very bad. It can get you very down, it can get you demotivated and discouraged and make you want to not contribute as, as openly and as much as you actually wanted to initially. But this is where the key is because this negative feedback is how we all grow. Um, but the main key is that it needs to be delivered correctly. A good example I've had in my personal experience while I worked at Uber was a code review that sounded absolutely horrible on text. But that was because, again, it was on text, it was very easy to misunderstand. So. A bad example of that is just saying, I don't like it, change it. Have anyone have, had that happen before? <laughs> I don't like this line of code, change it. But they don't actually explain what's wrong with it or what they don't like about it. So you kind of have to read their mind, which is very bad. Whereas the good, whereas the good example is that they explain what it actually is that they think is wrong and they give you a call to action that's not just a do this, they actually suggest. 
So the broader implications as a, in the, as a whole, when people get good feedback and they can feel they're growing, they feel as a part of a community. Whereas if they don't get any feedback or no one actually comments on their things, they just feel like they're screaming into an echo chamber. In addition, they also get very energized to work. If, uh, if people interact with you, you naturally get more energized and more happy that people are actually happy for your contributions. So, in addition to that, the good feedback also have a waterfall effect where, where you, when people actually receive good feedback, they will naturally adopt that way of giving feedback as well because one, it feels good, but they can also feel like you're growing. So that will also make them in the future try to adopt the same style of feedback to, when they have to give it to people. If positive feedback, if good feedback is giving, it, it would also, result in really amazing growth both for the community as a whole and as for the individual contributor. They'll also want to come back to your project. If you give them good feedback that, they, that where it has both positive and negative sides, they'll both have something to feel good about while still have some, having something to work on. That'll make them want to come back to give you to have even more contributing factor in your project as well as maybe talking to other people about your project because of the amazing community. So some practical tips for giving actual positive feedback. Positive feedback is most often seen on the softer side, on the human side of things. In, very, in many cases, we forget to give positive feedback in code reviews, as an example. Tell people if they're doing something right in the code. If they have a good implementation of something, tell them that you really like how they wrote it or how they implemented this solution to a specific problem. That'll make them feel good and it doesn't take more, much more than a few seconds. Also, tell them they do something right either, um, tell, them, yeah. tell them that they're doing something right, but don't overdo it. That can come can, can be reversed very quickly to coming off as being condescending. Just the main key here is the po positive feedback is useless for the receiver unless there's the why. Tell them why that you think it's good. Tell them why what they're doing is good and why they should continue. As an example, it's good that someone can be proactive because it, help, it helps getting things done quickly and it's great for everyone to take initiative. Or good that someone has an eye for detail because it helped us solve this bug that we've been having problems with for the last month. And last, um, do it without comparing to yourself. Don't start talking about what you would have done, but there was good what they did. Just have them actually, um, as we look at the example again, it's they come with a why. We, we like how they implemented it because it takes care of the S cases and while still keeping track of performance. There's no comparing, it's a, good, it's a good symbol, it's good because of something, and that fulfills all the criteria for, for positive side of feedback. So, tips for giving negative feedback. That can be summed up pretty easily. People will naturally remember negative things because that's what sticks in their brain. But also, it's the main thing they work on or can improve on. So on the same side, it's good as long as there's not too much of it. It's the same holds true for positive as well as negative as not comparing to yourself or say that we don't or I don't in the team. 
try to come up with suggestions, ask them first why they think it's actually bad, what they've implemented, or then afterwards come with suggestions or ask how we can solve it as a team or as an individual contributor. And if they still can't come up with anything after giving them ample time to think about it, then you can start suggesting them suggestions to improve. Again, with the example, just, I don't like it, change it. <laughs> to, I don't think it's a good implementation. That first of all opens the floor for a conversation instead of a, an ask or a tell. You explain why you don't think it's good, but still they end up with a call to action. What, do you, what can we do to fix it? Which again, it still fulfills negative criteria. There's something to work on, but it sounds much harsher than just a direct ask or tell and telling you that you're just bad. <laughs> so, sorry if I make you guys hungry, but um, the main way we can remember giving good feedback that incorporates both positive and negative uh, sides of feedback is by utilizing a sandwich method where we start with positive and then negative and then positive again. So why is this necessary? As we've gone over, if you only give someone positive feedback, there's nothing to improve on and that might be good, but in the short term, but in the longer term, it will stagnate the project or the team and have make no one, neither individual or team grow. But the inverse is also true. If you only have negative, that will very quickly have people want to leave your team or, it, or just not want to contribute as much as they did in the past. So positive and, and why don't we just give them the positive and the negative feedback? Well, pretty simple they'll hyper focus on the negative. Have anyone of you maybe had that happen where you had positive and then negative feedback and you totally forgot the positive because you hyper focus on the negative? Yeah. yeah. That's a very common thing. We tend to put way more value on negative things. So we, we forget the positive even though it was just said. So positive and negative and then positive. That's the way to go because if you also just have negative and positive, people tend to also just ignore the negative because the positive was said at the end. So if you have a method where you do positive and then negative and positive, you ensure that people have something to work on while still being praised for their work without it being too much. So I have a very funny story about that from my own experiences working both as an open source maintainer and also in a actual big tech company. <laughs> so the, the story boils down to, we ha I have a talk with my manager where he only gave, he started giving me positive feedback and then he gave me negative and that was it. And I had a really bad feeling for the rest of that day because I only remember the negative. So it also ensures that your maintainers or contributors won't have the rest of the day where they just feel down because of this feedback. So, delivering feedback. So delivering feedback in a physical space can also be very challenging, not just because of the words we say, but also how we compose ourselves. So very, quick tips to help improve that is to don't sit right on uh, opposite each other. That way it feels less like a confrontation and more like a conversation if you sit either beside each other or to the side of each other. And regardless of if you are at the positive or in the negative side of the method, just keep a smile on because at the end of the day it's a conversation 
and also we don't like being around negativity so people will naturally close themselves off to whatever you have to say and again and again keep your your composure nice keep it in warming and inviting have with the, your palms upwards at least so you have a, a warm and inviting attitude while you talk and last Keep a friendly tone and keep it casual. Just don't start sounding angry or upset or raise your voice because that only has the opposite effect of closing people off to whatever you're saying. An example I have with myself with keeping it casual was I, when I had my feedback sessions with my manager, it was called a formal feedback session. That sounds very scary. So, how do we deliver it online? If it's on a, a video platform such as Zoom or others, it works very much in the same way. Keep a smile on or keep a friendly tone, keep it casual. If it's on text though, spell checking is already, always a good idea, at least that way. If they, it's too hard to read what you wrote, they just will skip it or ignore it. <coughs> It also leaves room for easy miscommunication or misunderstanding if people think you wrote something else than you actually did. Also, don't imply anything or just assume they know. If you need to refer to something, just talk about it, not like the thing or, you know, or actually spell out that you're referring to issue whatever or the thing that happened on this day or like the... And of course, a good way to always end feedback is that they're always welcome to follow up with any additional questions they might have. And of course, just like in physical spaces, the, met the sandwich method that we saw earlier can also still be applied here. So, in quick summary and conclusion, good feedback consists of both positive and negative. Good feedback has a, a waterfall effect where people in the future will remember your feedback style and naturally give it on to, to someone else. Positive or negative feedback can't stand alone. They need to be combined. Just remember to be open and inviting whenever giving people feedback. Remember it's a conversation where you can grow as the giver, you can learn how to manage people, how to give feedback, and where the recipient also can grow their skill set and their other, like, more softer skills. And then we have a little time for Q&A. If someone have any questions, you can just, yeah, say it out in the room. This was a little easier with a smaller audience, but yeah. Anyone have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Very excellent presentations. Thank you, Thanks. Jessica. Uh, my question is that uh, you just mentioned what's the good or bad example of feedback. I'm considering how to perceive those bad or good uh, feedback. Uh, in the community automatically because uh, you know we can receive a lot of different feedbacks from issue from pull request and every day so I don't think we we have enough time to perceive those feedback it's good on or bad uh, case by case or issue by issue pull request review by review they are is there any recommended way to perceive that uh, quickly or efficiently? Thank you. Okay, so to answer that, the very uh, some small steps we covered as well that you can start uh, implementing today to make sure that we don't have to go through this process of trying to identify it is as, a, as us as feedback givers, make sure to both 
to uh, talk about what they can improve, but also what they did well. That way we kind of mix and match like both of them. This mostly applies to stuff like code reviews or if you're in a bigger organization and manage people and you have to hit KPIs or something like that. Issues is more talking about the actual issue at hand where pull requests, that's what more where you can start actually going in and reviewing and giving feedback to people. I hope that answered your question. Thanks. Yes. Um, you mentioned in your introductions that you were um, that you are a maintainer of PyPandoc. What type of feedback have you received from the uh, Python community? That I've received uh, both. Um, both feedback and assistance in the sense that people told me when Python 2 reached the, their end of life, they said, Python 2 is bad, remove it. But again, that's, that's one side. I also got assistance for that. Many times when I make code changes, I leave it up for a few, um, for a week or so, mostly for people to comment if they have any suggestions because I'm the maintainer, I could just merge it right away. But in that way, we actually, I ensure that people are on board with the, the changes I decide to make or the way I have decided to fix an issue. Usually the, the kind of feedback I get is from either, um, from, from people that either ask clarify, clarifying questions or they suggest other ways to do it. And that's where we can, again, have that conversation where we can understand where each other are coming from and we can together find the best way moving forward. Well, thank you. And, and to follow up on that, you said that you'll usually wait a week for people to comment um, on a PR before you merge it. Um, do you just uh, let it, do you just wait that week or do you reach out to the community to say, hey, this is a, a pretty big new feature that someone has um, put in. What do you all think? Are, are you proactive? Um, or do you do you just kind of uh, sit back and um, if, if nothing comes, you, you just merge? Yeah. So and how do you make that decision on which way to go? Yeah, so typically if there's already an issue, um, an issue out for it, I'll tag the original um, kind of discussion, like the, the people that had the discussion in the issue and say, hey, there's a pull request out for it. Feel free to let me know what you think about it. Um, if it's a new feature where there's not an issue already, I typically go to the Pandoc discussion groups there um, because they know of me already. So I, I say, I, I make a post there saying, hey, I have this pull request for the Python wrapper of it. What do you guys think? Should I do anything differently? Um, but it all depends if there's an, an ongoing discussion already or I, ha I have to be the, the one that takes that initiative. Thank you. Of course. Hey, Jessica. Um, thanks a lot for the presentation. There is a lot of good things to, I'm going to consider for my future feedback. So the question that I have is, um, as a maintainer, how do you deal with the apathy? When the, I mean, you, you mentioned about receiving good or feedback, uh, well, or bad feedback, but what about those cases where like, the, the contributors or like the people are not willing to share any feedback at all, like <laughs> neither a good one or, or bad one. So how, how do you um, encourage to, to the contributors or to the maintainers to provide feedback? Yes, so that's a, uh, that, that, that's almost in a topic in itself. Uh, I can give you a few pointers, but we can also talk about it offline if, if that'll be better. But um, the few pointers I, I have found useful is have, um, of course, open discussions. Don't just use issues as an example, issues on GitHub or GitLab to just for code things or things that are not working, but use them as way to actually gather feedback. Start an issue where you ask, okay, we have a new upcoming version, we have these features and um, what do you guys think? Like, I think same. What should we prioritize first? Like, keep keep the discussion open and don't just limit it to code specific. 
Um, and I think it's also both a way to share feedback openly on GitHub, but also get in contact with the maintainer team or you if you're a single uh, maintainer, just like privately through Twitter or something else to make make that obvious in the readme as like what should be under the contributor um, heading or in the code on the contributing like file of how people can provide feedback and make it clear that we are not just looking for code specific feedback but also feedback about governance or documentation or similar other non-code related topics but again it's a whole thing in itself how to actually get people interested um, so we can talk much more about that uh, offline if you want okay thank you of course Um, um, there's uh, the thing with the uh, feedback and uh, gut feeling, which is really hard because uh, you said that uh, bad feedback is, um, I don't like it, change that. Um, but sometimes uh, when you know a software and somebody changes and something and you have the gut feeling that this is not a good choice but you cannot really explain, then it's hard to give feedback on that. Yes, I, I totally understand that point. Um, but I, I make the counterpoint that there's always a reason for wanting to change something because either because it's not a bit best practice or because there, there must, my point being that there must be something that we can link to or say we, it, it's not a good idea because I don't know, these people had it before and it's just that, that didn't go well for them or something like that. Like there must be there is always a reason for a gut feeling, whether like we remember it or not. There's we have probably read it or seen it somewhere before. I'm not discounting uh, your question or your, your feelings. I just have a I just have a, a very strong belief that everything happens. Um, every gut feeling we get is for a reason. But again, the another thing is like then switch it around and say, okay, I don't think it's um, the optimal solution can we find another solution that solve this problem better? Because that way you let it, you are letting them know that it's not actually you know, their thing that's bad. You just think it couldn't be done in a smarter way, but without putting the blame on them, if that makes sense. Um, thank you for the talk, first of all. Um, when talking about this uh, feedback cycle, basically for a pull request or something like that, um, I guess especially for larger open source projects, there is now more and more bots basically involved in the conversation, right? You push your merge request and the first thing that you get back is a very angry linter telling you uh, <laughs> this, is, this is not the, the right thing to do. And I guess like people in IT tend to accept this, this part to a certain point because it's not a human giving feedback, but it's yes. an angry linter and it's a machine, right? <laughs> yeah, that's just um, funny. <laughs> but 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 what is the like uh, general what what is your opinion on this this limit there because like I had personally experienced that I invested a lot of time into writing code and um, I had the feeling after some weeks only talking to bots there basically telling me yeah this is not good this is not good that is not good do you have the feeling there's a like a, a limit where human interaction is needed to a certain point for pull requests or do you have the feeling there you first have to pass this this bar of the machine needs to be happy and then humans uh, can join the feedback cycle. Yeah, so for the first half, I think it's definitely important, if at all possible, for these bots to give the context. So many times when we see these linters, it's just, it's bad. But yeah, okay, we, we have like code coverage of your, your, your pull request give code coverage of 82%, but what's the standard in the project? Is the standard, like if his standard is 95%, then, then there's maybe something to work on. But if the standard is 75%, then all of a sudden you're doing really well. And I have seen many projects where they use these automated bots, linters, code uh, coverage, test reviewers, and so on. But they don't actually provide any 
insight into what is the standard? How is the master brands looking with code, code coverage? Like, how, how are we doing on main? Are we, are we back? Are we like behind or forwards? It's all about the like reference point. So I would say if at all possible, if to change the bots to link to the, the, like the coverage or the linting before the, the, the pull request or put it in the main readme. For the second half, I definitely think that even though the bots are being angry at you, humans like shouldn't wait until the bots are happy <laughs> with coming with feedback and co constructive code, like code or non-code review and feedback. I definitely think as soon as the pull request is open, that that loop can begin regardless of the bots. The bots are here to ensure like automated code quality, but they're not there to, to reason about the actual functionality of the code. So I think they can run in, in parallel. Thank you. Of course. We have a little more time. Is there time for one more question? Yeah, there's plenty of time. Um, as a woman and as someone who is unsighted, unsighted um, do you feel, do you think you receive feedback differently from your peers? And if so, um, what are ways you think that people um, can uh, equalize the, the playing field and in, in how they provide feedback to everyone um, and not just you as a woman or you as a person who is unsighted? Yeah, um, it goes back to what I said earlier about keeping the standards for the project, for the team, like open and available for everyone. Like if you're work, working in a corporation and you need to hit, hit KPIs or similar, keep those KPIs open for the team. Um, or at least if you can't do that because it's individual to everyone, then tell like have a company wide average for like your position. If you're a junior or senior software engineer, then have a, an average so you know like what you should hit so you know you're not getting low ball or high ball depending on your uh, diversified like circumstances and on the other hand it also just comes down to trust how do you how do you um, see uh, people talk about your the one that's giving you the feedback are they getting really good feedback while you're getting like trashed or is the the other way around that they're sugar coding it for you while actually giving um, more constructive feedback. And of course, um, a second thing is you're always welcome to tell the people that's giving you the feedback how well you received that feedback. Again, it's an open conversation. You're allowed to give them feedback about their feedback to you as well. I hope that answered the question. If Thank not, we you. can always talk about it offline. I would love to. Thank you. Time for two more questions, maybe? If anyone has any. No? Maybe? Yeah. Thanks for your talk. Thanks. Um, I want to switch this a little bit from where we talk mostly about contributors right now. So how about feedback from users? Um, because we are a little bit more on, on above the stack, so the users directly interact with our um, project. And the, we, I think we have a okay feedback culture with the maintainers and contributors, but we have sometimes problems with users um, because they expect basically enterprise support from a free time open source project. Um, what are your thoughts on how to provide feedback for them that this is? not to be expected. <laughs> well, first of all, I have had some experience from that from the GitHub Accelerator program. So if you want to talk, dive into that later, I'll be happy to have a chat with you. Um, well, the, there's two sides. One, if they expect enterprise support, if it's it, like people that's using your software in, in a small, medium or large business, then give them enterprise support. Figure out how you can give it like make it like financially viable and, and build from there. But if you are not interested in that, um, give them specific criteria to give you feedback. 
give them like a form. Like it's really difficult to figure out what kind of feedback you're gonna get if you just say, hey, give us feedback. And then a form where they can just write whatever. Ask like, what do you think is good? What can be improved? What are your annoyances? What are you happy about? Like give them actual more specific like, sub prompts of specific things you wanna measure. Yeah, we use this this uh, GitHub template for discussions. So yes. basically, the issues are closed off for co uh, continuing uh, repeatedly contributors, mm -hmm. and the normal landing page for users is another discussion page with templates. Um, but usually, they ignore it. <laughs> then I would honestly um, say, if, like, you can send them a nice message in the issue. Say, hey, please use the template. Um, and if they keep ignoring it, then just say, sorry, like we, we have a template for a reason. Please refer to our, our contributor guide on like how to like provide your issues, whatever. And then like say, I'm sorry, but like you need to follow the template and then like be nice about it, but be firm in your boundaries and then close the issue. Okay, thanks. We do this with labels basically and then let the bot do that. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, thanks for exactly. your feedback. I think that's all we have time for today, but if anyone wants to ask me more questions, I'll be around here for a little longer, right outside the room and while people are clearing out. But if not, um, I'm so happy that so many came out. Thank you everyone for your time. Thanks for listening.